I don't want to just rehash what we've talked about in the past. We've, we've been there. Uh, I only really want to look at what our goals are because our goals do not change no matter what chapter that we are on. And though that we have talked about being a functioning mem member, we've been talk talked about being a unified member. And so in chapter number three, we talk about, I'm not going to let my, uh, let my church be about my preferences and desires. Page number 33 in your book. But the goals that we have uh, already set is that we would critically, critically examine um, uh, what it means to be a church, uh, what it means to be a church member from God's point of view. And also to generate ideas that will help all church members become more engaged in the life of the church and ministry. So that is our goal, and so that is what we are looking at. And so as we dive in tonight, let's just dive in first by reading in our book. And we'll do it um, really by section, if you would. So if someone would read uh, page number 33 over to the middle of page number 30, uh, 35. Often I'm tempted to use the illustrations of my children in a very setting, since I have such a love for my three sons. Even now that they are adults with their own children, I sometimes find myself talking about them when they were little boys. So I thought I might begin this chapter by giving an illustration about my boys busting and fighting because they wanted something their way. But then I began to think about how many times I followed my own older brother because I wanted it my way right now, without compromise. I could be a selfish brat, and sometimes it's good we grow out of that phase after we become adults, right? It's even better that we never revert to that phase after we become Christians, right? Wrong. Christians can sometimes act just like those demanding children who want, their, want things their way. Temper tantrums in churches may not include church members lying on the floor kicking the screen, but some come close. But the strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up your preferences when you join. Don't get me wrong. There may be much about your church that you like a lot, but you are there to meet the needs of others. You are there to serve others. You are there to give. You are there to sacrifice. Get the picture? Jesus would often say things that confounded his listeners. You see, even his disciples had a tendency to fight with one another. On one occasion, the twelve were arguing about who was the greatest. Can you imagine that? The closest followers of Jesus were having a need first fight. The Bible says that Jesus stopped and sat down and called these grown men together. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wanted to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Ouch. I would have loved to have been a fly on my cloak and seen their expressions. Yep, he got you this time, you self-serving disciples. And then it hits me. That text is much for me as well. As a member, as a church member, my motivation should not be to get my preferences to the top of the list. I am supposed to be the last, not the first. I am supposed to be a servant instead of seeking to be served. Okay, let's dig a little deeper into what it means to be a servant. Amen. So that question about servanthood. Very good. Any of you ever think about your childhood? Any of you have siblings that you grew up with? Did you ever think about how you were? Were you ever selfish? And sometimes it unfortunately even goes into adults. Sometimes I see adult children. Good grief. But, but most of the time, that's, that's put aside. And so we have to understand while church uh, is a place where our spiritual needs are met, it should be first the place where I come and serve. We think about our spiritual needs being met, and probably most people think about church. I'm coming to church because my spiritual needs will be met there. Do we ever really think about the aspect of what Christ has called us to do, that we are come to serve? Have you thought about that? You've come tonight to church to serve. God's placed us in this body of believers that we can serve one another. That's powerful. That we can serve one another. Um, which should never be about what, 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 uh, 
what, what we can get from the church from our own personal gain. In fact, some people will, will be like little children and throw temper tantrums and, and fits because they want what they want from the church because they want it for their gain, not because they've learned to serve others as Christ came to serve us. I'll probably say this again, but of all the things that God could have did for us, He chose to send Himself in the form of His Son in flesh and blood that He may come and serve. That is powerful to think that God Almighty would choose servanthood. So if He Himself came to serve, who are we that we would neglect our responsibility as believers to serve one another? I love what, what he says. Probably the most powerful paragraph to me is, but I think it's uh, uh, strange uh, about membership, is to actually give up your preferences when you join. Uh, 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 the church isn't about your needs as much as it is about meeting the needs of others. We are to serve. We are there to give. We are there to sacrifice. Probably most people in the church world don't think about church being their place where they go to sacrifice. Someone said this to me recently, and it just became powerful to me. They said, just remember, there is no resurrection without a sacrifice. I thought, wow, that's good. None of us like to sacrifice. But we all like the power of resurrection and the miraculous and the life about it. But God has called us to sacrifice. And God has called us to serve one another. Even before his death on the cross, what did he do at that last supper? He served. He was showing us once again what it's really about. It's about serving. His whole death on the cross was because he came to serve. He gave his life in servanthood for us. So let's dig a little deeper. What is it like to be a servant? Someone to read there at least the first part of uh, mid-35 through mid-36. The word servant occurs 57 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it refers to a person who has that official role in a household. But many times it refers to the role we are to assume as Christians. Also, serve occurs 58 times in the New Testament. Get the picture? Serving is important in the Bible. Jesus said we must be last of all and serve and serve of all. That doesn't sound like that doesn't sound like all the church members we may know. Many church members demand their preferences, their, des their desires, the way they've always done it. But Jesus said we are to serve. Paul said it as well. After he became a Christian, the apostle declared, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the work of his power. From Ephesians 3 7. We will never find joy. We will never find joy in church membership, but we are constantly seeking things our way. But paradoxically, we will find the greatest joy when we choose to be last. That's what Jesus meant when he said, the last will be first. True joy means giving up our rights and preferences and serving everyone else. And that's what church membership means as well. Amen. <coughs> Isn't that powerful? I want us to stop here before we go any farther. I want to ask us a question. And I know that we have questions back here and sometimes I may be get ahead of myself a little bit, but I feel like sometimes it's better to be integrated in where we're at. But let me ask you this question. What do you think it means from Scripture, what do you think it means to serve somebody? There's no right, there's no wrong, there's no judgment. It's just being able to participate. What does it mean to serve? What does it look like when you say, I'm going to serve in my church? We do. It's a hard wanting to help, wanting to extend yourself um, without wanting any kind of credit back. Just to have 
be a part of the government. They're able to serve. I agree very much. Since that servanthood, without even if no one notices, it's okay because I'm here to serve. I don't need any accolades. Someone else. Same as you know, to be willing to do it, you have to know that you're out there. Just know that there's a unit that needs to go. Very good. Sit. What's that? Someone's got to go. Amen. Seeing the need. Doing it. Once again, it doesn't matter if there's recognition. It doesn't matter if someone notices or gives you praise. Um, you do it. Somebody else. It's like going out of your way to help someone. Like holding the door for someone, you know, that, that might be on at a, a walker or something like that. Or trying to go out of your way just to help someone, you know. Mm -hmm. That might be that you help. I can't, I can't uh, get him along without help, you know, like, like when we uh, have a fan, you know, and we out there in, in the fan, you know, not everybody can just jump in, you know. Sure. Sometimes you have to help them, you know, as they go along. Seeing the need, making sure it's taken care of. Someone else, what's it mean to, 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 to serve someone? Well, they just say a kind word. Amen. It makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be a gift. It can be verbalization, articulating something to someone. Mr. Richard, that's you. If we focus on serving Someone else. All of these were excellent answers. Very good. I think some things that I would like to say is that we're more observant of others, but observant in a good way. There are some folks that are observant, and it's just critical and it's negative. And there's nothing, there's nothing good that you're looking for, but you're there to critique. I'm not talking about that type of observancy. In fact, that's wrong. In fact, the Spirit of God needs to be in your heart and wash you, that that is washed away. But it's being observant of others in a good way. Um, you know, we can become creatures of habit. Almost when we come into church, uh, Brother Al, you said this to me a couple of weeks ago. Everybody kind of sits in the same seat. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think someone thinks that they own a seat. You're willing to move if someone wants to move. But we come in and we sit in the same seat. But I wonder how observant we are of that neighbor who sits beside of us. How observant, or do we just come in and it's kind of the routine we come in when it's an opportunity for us to observe. Maybe last week they come in smiling. And this week, see, things just don't seem to be as right. They're maybe a little distracted or, 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 or maybe uh, they seem down. Or have you ever really watched someone's body language? What is their, their, their body language telling you? As, because Christ has called us here to observe. And once again, uh, uh, we, we have an opportunity to, to notice and to look. Can I tell you that is the first part of servanthood is being observant. And I believe that if we will be observant in our marriage, in our parenting skills, or in any other relationship God has given us, the best way we can have a healthy relationship is to be observant of what's going on there. And then not only be observant of seeing what's, what's going on, but we have to be available. Sometimes we put ourselves on such a tight schedule and we have everything else planned when it's all about us and my schedule and what I'm doing. But we also have to be available to others. Maybe sometimes they just need that word. Maybe sometimes it feels uncomfortable for us to break down a barrier. But we have to make ourselves available. And then we have to be willing to meet that need. Let me just talk to you for a moment. 
I know it's a circular idea, but I just want to bring it to you that you can think about it and we can apply the biblical principle to it. How many of you have ever went to a restaurant before and maybe the food was really, 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 really good. However, uh, the, 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 the service was terrible. I mean, you, you know, that it was just terrible. The cleanliness wasn't there. Your, your, your waiter or waitress wasn't there. Uh, uh, they, they weren't on top of it. You had to wait forever for your food. And, and, and so it was just bad. Maybe the, your, your, your person who was taking your order, taking care of you, they were curt. They were not nice. And so you look at that and you think, that was a bad experience. But you went somewhere that maybe the food was less than. But you had a waiter or waitress that was Johnny on the spot. They were right there. They were taking your order. They saw when your drink was out. They didn't even have to ask you what type of drink that you had. They were replenishing it right away. They were there. They were taking care of you with napkins or whatever your needs were. And, 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 and which one would you rather go to? Where there's good service. Where is sermon if it is? Do you know what the best church is? You may say, but listen, you're not the best preacher in the whole world. I can take that. I'll own that. But I don't think our not church is. What's that? Not in the yeah. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, you may be average. Thank you. I'll take average. <laughs> but if our servanthood in our church, that is what will make our church exceptional. Because Christ has called us to serve. This isn't a club that we come in when we come out. This is the family of God where Christ has called us and placed us. That we really learn to love and to serve one another. There may be people that your personality clicks with and it's easy for you to serve. And then there are others that they are just different from you. So the personality is a little bit different. Or maybe they fit into a stigma that you think blah, 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 blah. But we need to be taking care of people and serving. But not only in the church, but outside the church. Because our servanthood goes from not just the body of Christ, but to the world to evangelize them and show them the love of God. God help us. People will never find joy in church membership who are constantly seeking things their own way. But paradoxically, they will find joy when they choose to be last. That is what, that, that is what makes church membership the best, is when we choose to be last. Christ said in Mark chapter number 9, verse number 35, and he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, who's going to be first in heaven? It was their response to this, this question. Who's going to be the greatest? The same shall be last of all and servant of all. What is the opposite of what we really think becomes the reality of who will be first in the kingdom? God. I think we're going to be surprised. I think we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven of who really is first. Because it's those who fell on gross serve. It's not, we need to know the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to know doctrinally. But we also need to apply it and we need to have servanthood. It's not going to be the one who had the most beautiful voice in the church singing or had the greatest ability or talent in ministering in some way. It's going to be the one who is faithful in serving. Not saying it can't be that person. But that can't be <coughs> your servant just because you have talent. God's called us all to serve. Yeah, they, they Amen. But when we have the heart of Christ, we will have a heart of servant. Yeah. So let me read this, and then I'll have different ones of you read it. Verse number, uh, uh, point number one through ten. My research team recently conducted, conducted a survey of churches that were inwardly focused 
For the most part, they were not serving past their own walls and their own member. In other words, these churches were largely self-serving. In our survey, we found 10 dominant behavior patterns of members in these churches. See if you recognize any. I don't want to just be self-serving. Yes, I want us to serve one another, but I want it to reach out into our community, into the greater area of, of, of northern Dauphin County, that folks know that this is a church that loves God. We have people that are in it to win it. They are church members. By God's perspective. Someone reversed uh, 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 number one in the survey. Worship boards. One or more factions in the church want to do just the way they like it. Any deviation is met with anger and demands for change. The order of service must remain constant. Certain instrument, instrumentation is required while others are prohibited. Do you know what? Church is like this. It doesn't matter when the preaching, when the song service is, it doesn't matter how the order goes. For those who are so structured and they get bent out of shape, I don't think you can be Pentecostal and get this way, just to be honest. We got to be spirit led, right? So you, we can't be getting bent out of shape over what's happening. Amen. It's about servanthood. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter about the music. Uh, one person sings slower songs. Maybe some sing faster songs. Maybe some like clapping their hands. Maybe some like standing up. Some like sitting down. Or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Those are not the things that really matter in the church. The things that matter. Let me, let me reiterate. Those matter. It needs to be God-centered. I, I don't think about the music outside the room. We're blessed here with folks that love God and love to sing music that brings doctrine and worship. But it's more than just that. If the song, minutes, song service is five minutes, 15 minutes, or 30 minutes, or takes the service, it doesn't matter. It's about service to one another. So I want to read uh, uh, number two. Along the new show meetings. The church spends an inordinate amount of time in different meetings. Most of the meetings deal with the most inconsequential items, while the Great Commission and the Great Commandments are rarely the topics of discussion. So sometimes church can be about meetings, 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 and never really focus on the Great Commission to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They can be focused on all types of things, but it can be very not God-focused. I'm not someone who likes dragging things out. I don't, even when church is done, we're done the altar call, I typically do not speak long. I am done, uh, unless the Spirit of God is working and moving. In meetings, when, when we do black light, when we do church meet, whatever, I'm not about being long and drawn out and going down the trail that doesn't bring focus to the commission of God. Number three. Church facilities develop iconic status. One of the highest priorities in the church is the protection and preservation of rooms, furniture, and other visible parts of the church's buildings and grounds. So, I think it's very important. I think in, in the next several months ahead, I think that we need to do a lot of overhaul in our church, to be honest. We're in a good place financially to do that. We need to get it done. Uh, I think that it needs to be a beautiful place to worship. But I don't think this is some type of shrine that we have to worry about someone, how they come in, that they would. This is God's house for all people. Now, on the other side, I also do believe I have children. I own it. I have children that you can try to feed them before church, and all of a sudden, their belly is so stinking hungry when they get to church. I understand all that. I understand that. Now, there does come an age where you don't see me, see me, see me sitting there eating roll-ups. I may pop a mint now and then for my throat, for my voice, and so when I shake your head, my breath don't stink. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one thing that is for sure. When I am done, we try to pick up our pew. This is God's house. Amen. And we've got to take good care. So it's a balance on both sides of the spectrum. We've got to take care of God's house. It should be picked up. It should be taken care of. But it is also not a place 
that all we worry about is the facility without ever worrying about souls and the ministry that's at hand. We will never be able to touch these same people in 10 years. This is our moment of expectation for God to work and move. Our focus has to be upon serving. So I want to read number four. Program three. Every church has programs, even if they don't admit it. When we start doing ministry a certain way, it takes on a programmatic status. <coughs> the trouble or the problem is not with programs. The problem develops when the program becomes an, an end instead of a means to the greater ministry. So, what's he saying? So, Blacklight's a wonderful thing. We've been doing it a lot of years now, haven't we? So, it started out very, very small. And I would never have thought it would have grown to what it is now. It's a lot of work. It's a program. I'll be honest. It's really nice to have the church. I mean, Sunday morning, we've got a nice crowd. I have no qualms. God has been good to us. We see a lot of new faces. We've been blessed. I'd like to see growth in other areas. We will. We're not going to see it by beating people over the head. We're going to see it as we pray and as we serve. That's how it's going to happen. But black light has always got to be about why we would do black light. It's about souls. It's not about a show. It's not about entertainment. It's not about packing the house as big as we can. It's about presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to our community. And when we start adding a program instead of a ministry, we've messed up. I think this year it's been pretty neat for me. I was done with white elephant. In fact, over the past couple of years, I've just been done. I've not been satisfied with the results of it. And so this year, I wanted to change it. I don't know what it was starting that was going on before I came. But I just wasn't, I wanted to make it more of a worship. I want you folks just grab right hold, and I think that was the best Christmas party we had in years. You know why? Because it can't be about the program. It's got to be about the ministry. And so that's what we've got to remember even as we grow and we enlarge. It's got to be about the ministry. God, help us to be Christ-centered, commission-centered, and serve others. That's what it's got to be about. Someone read number five. We will be focused budget. A disproportionate share of the budget is used to meet the need and comforts of the members instead of reaching beyond the walls of the church. So our budget, it can't be about just meeting the needs of our members. We faithfully support missionaries. We faithfully support some areas of ministry that otherwise would suffer. I can tell you that the board has chosen, and sometimes we've also chosen to help some people out that are in desperate need. And so we choose to do that. God has blessed us. I don't feel like we're inwardly focused. I think we strive to meet one another's needs, but we do try to focus outwardly. But we always have to keep that as a goal, to serve. So someone read number six.
the, the leadership of this church to be there. Let's always remember that sometimes the leader can't always be everything. But we're striving to be the best that we can. And so we learn to serve one another. I'm thankful too. I'm here to serve you. But there has been multiple times folks have poured water in my hands. And I've needed those encouraging words. And so thank you. Amen. Thank you. Someone read uh, 7. And Jews, seven title. This issue could be a catch-all for many of the points named here. The overarching attitude is one of demanding and having a sense of deserving special treatment. Amen. I don't feel like we have that in our church, but we have to protect it. It can be a problem when folks feel like they have entitlement to something. Amen. When none of us are above serving. None of us are entitled to anything. We're saved by the grace of God and required to serve, even as Christ commanded and he told his disciples, whoever is the last will be the greatest in the kingdom. So I want to read number eight. So there's going to be change. It can be hard. We, I think this, I think for me, to be able to look and see where we're at as a church and think that sometimes this ministry isn't what we need. We need to shift because our need is here. But no matter what in the shift, and sometimes folks can feel slighted or folks can feel hurt, but we have to shift for the change of the church, not changing the gospel, but we have to remember in everything that we do that we want to we want the gospel to be the center of why we do what we do. It's not about an individual, it's not about preferences. It's about the best presenting the gospel so that lives can be changed for eternity. Someone read verse number uh, not verse, I keep saying verse. Someone read number nine. You know, complaining is like a cancer. It just metastasizes. And when someone complains, it's just going to eat away. It's going to destroy. It's going to hurt others. And so being hostile or being angry continually, it's, it's detrimental. It's death to a church. God help us to be that unifying member and say, this isn't about my preferences. This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ being exalted. Someone read uh, 10. Evangelistic apathy. Very few members share their faith on a regular basis. More concerned about their own needs rather than the greatest eternal needs of the world and the community in which they live. Think about that. Is that you and I? Are we more concerned about our needs or are we more concerned about evangelizing the world because they need Jesus? Church can be about our preferences. And when it becomes that, the community at large around us doesn't get evangelized by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need to tell you that I'm always going to preach the truth and I'm not going to compromise it. But I'm also going to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Because I want to make sure that every person that enters this church sees the love of Jesus Christ and their heart is convicted to accept Jesus as their Savior and to make heaven their home. Amen. God help us. But it's not about preferences, but it's about evangelizing and sharing the gospel. Jesus help. Someone go ahead and read that next uh, ending up to 39. In almost every behavior of love, church members were looking out for their own needs and preferences. I want the music my way. I want the building my way. I'm upset because the pastor didn't visit me. I don't want to change anything in my church. You get the picture. I, me, myself. Church membership from a biblical perspective, however, is about services. It's about giving. It's about putting others first. Amen. For the
the sake of time, someone to read the mind of Christ, just that mind of Christ, uh, 39, just from the mind of Christ out of the Bible. One of the best descriptions of the attitude we should embody was written by Paul in Philippians 2, 5, through 11. The Apostle says, Come gently and powerfully, make your own attitude that of Jesus Christ. So what did Jesus do? He did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave. He humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Keep in mind that Philippians 2 is not only a description of the obedience of Christ, it is an example for us to follow. We are to be servants. We are to be obedient. We are to put others first. We are to do whatever it takes to keep the unity in our church. So if we approach church membership from the perspective of entitlement, we have it upside down. You always ask first what you can do for your church. Then you will discover the joy of being black. Amen. What can I do? I want you to think about that in Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11, as we think about that put on the mind of Christ. Not a mind that thinks it's about me, but it's a mind of giving. It's a mind of serving. I'm not here to be seen or heard. I'm here to bring glory to God, having the mind of Christ. He thought it not robbery uh, 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 to, to, to take on to himself flesh and blood, being equal with God. He came to serve. The mind of Christ is to serve. How can I serve others? Be that observant of seeing and noticing, watching, and then being available to meet the need and investing in it. Emptying of ourself. Part of that really is taking up our cross and learning to die to ourself, putting Christ first. But it means also that we put others even before ourselves. I know that there are times that we have to take care of ourselves, but life is not all about taking care of yourself. There are things that we can do that would better serve the kingdom of God if we said no to ourselves and yes to the needs of others. I think if you talk to anybody who's older, anybody who's older and has lived life, particularly those who live for God, even <coughs> those who maybe don't completely live for God, you ask them what joy is all about and they'll tell you it's about serving others. So our life experience teaches us. So if a life experience teaches us, why don't we learn from the life experience of others? But even greater, why don't we learn about a life experience that Christ has called us to, to a life of servanthood? So really, verse page 40 and verse number uh, and, and 41, the commitment is very personal. So I'm going to let you be personal with that as, as you think about that and as you sign that pledge, that you're going to pledge, that you're going to be a church member, that it won't be about your preferences and desires, that is self-serving, but you've come to this church to serve others as you serve Christ. I know it's nine, but any... Uh, Briefly, any comments or thoughts?